welcome to Soul of Travel podcast. I'm really excited today for this special interview in collaboration with Women in Travel CIC and happy to be joined by Zina Benchek, who's the Managing Director of the EMEA region of Intrepid. And I have been really looking forward to this conversation, so I can't wait to learn from you and have you share your expertise in this conversation with us. Thank you so much for having me. It's a great pleasure for me. Thank you. Well, to begin our conversation, Zina, I would just love to turn it over to you, actually, and give you a moment to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about uh, the work that you're doing right now at Intrepid. Sure. So obviously, I'm, my name is Zina. I've been um, working in the travel industry for 13 years now. My background is not in travel. I came from a finance auditing background, um, you know, working in Paris, uh, big, big corporation. Found myself in the travel industry a bit by mistake or, you know, by chance um, in 2010 when I found this um, finance director role um, with Intrepid in Morocco. It was one of their newest office. Um, and I was looking for a finance job in, in Morocco back home to, so I could come back and settle back home where, um, you know, I was just, um, um, you know, just got married and just decided to, to return home for that. Um, I followed then um, my career in 13 years. I think I had six different jobs. So a lot of promotions, uh, lots of opportunities that Intrepid has offered to me from finance director for Europe and Morocco to regional finance director for the Europe, Middle East and North Africa region, and then become a general manager for Europe and Morocco, and then a regional general manager for Europe, Morocco and North Africa. Then I decided to move to um, the UK in 2019, and I spent two and a half years uh, running the UK market for the UK and Europe market from our UK hub in London uh, for Intrepid. So Intrepid is the largest um, adventure travel, one of the largest adventure travel company in the world. We are specialized in small group adventures that take people in more than 100 destinations across seven continents uh, on small group tours that tend to be immersive, um, that are led by local tour leader, tour guide, um, where we stay in locally owned accommodation, mostly use public transport, and explore the destination um, as a local, um, if I want to summarize. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing. Um, and over the course of the interviews that I've done here at Soul Travel, Intrepid definitely comes up a lot when we're talking about meaningful travel and impactful travel and innovations and, you know, kind of really being able to shift the paradigms in travel. So it's really exciting to be able to have you here and, and have you representing, you know, that Part of the conversation that that we're hearing about so much. Um, I would also, you, you know, you mentioned that you didn't start in tourism, but you know, you kind of fell into fell into it and then really started to lean into that work. Uh, what what has really kept you engaged in the industry and started to kind of shape your focus on responsible tourism, um, empowering women in travel? community-based tourism. I know those things are, are all things that you're really passionate about. Um, what really keeps you focused in that region? Look, um, when I started with Intrepid, I had no idea what Intrepid was about and what small group adventure was about. And in fact, it's, it's a lot of people in this world that don't travel in small group adventure and, and responsible travel or sustainable travel has become a bit more known now, but you know, 10, 13 years ago, it was still a niche and not very, very, very known. First thing that really stuck me is when I started uh, in Morocco, I saw this style of travel that was truly giving back, that had this amazing impact on, on the communities, the people, um, you know, the, the partners that we had locally that we were supporting through the Intrepid Foundation, uh, the Intrepid Foundation, which is our philanthropic arm. And I was thinking, wow, these people are not even Moroccan and they're doing good stuff. Good stuff in, in, in my own country. And, and I just thought it was fabulous to, that this style of travel could exist. I then went on my first intrepid trip in Thailand and I could experience it myself in another country and truly enjoyed it and, and really felt passionate about this, this style of, of traveling. And as I became a general manager, I think this is where the shift really um, has become important. I realized I was quite young as a woman uh, in a leadership position uh, in the travel industry in Morocco. And um, it was challenging to many extent. Uh, you know, there was always that question, why is she here? You know, is, is, it, is it a place for women? But then I saw the shift in other women's eyes looking at me like, wow, she can do it. 
then I could do it as well. And then this is where the change really started to, to, to become apparent for me. And I started to realize I have a responsibility. Um, and in my job as a general manager, I actually can make change and it can you know, give, be an example and drive um, innovation towards more responsible ways of traveling, toward a, a, a travel industry that's a bit more inclusive. Um, and, and I just have that possibility because I'm a GM and I work for the right company that enables us to do that as well. So that's really where it has started to become for me almost a mission, if that makes sense, and a responsibility. And, and as I've been growing into my different positions, I had the ability to meet people to, because of you know, having bigger title and more responsibilities, you get to know more people and you, you, you become part of, you know, sometimes board meetings or, or, or you know, part of, of, of meetings in general where you're the only women, the only women of color, that's for sure. Um, and so you feel like you can bring a voice and create a change and use that power for that. So that's what I've really tried to do um, since then. Um, leveraging partnerships to, to you know, make the travel industry more inclusive as well. That's something that I was really, I am very passionate about. Um, can talk more about examples if you want, but there's been lots of initiatives that we, you know, we've been dri driving because we could see the impact um, that it could drive, um, especially when it comes to empowering communities. So for example, um, giving them access, like for example, in, in Morocco, if I wanna be specific, we've got this um, association called Education for All that gives access to uh, education to young girls who otherwise wouldn't have access to education because in rural areas, sometimes illiteracy rates get to 80%. So we, we actually don't send, or parents don't send their girls to school because it's just far away, there are not enough schools. And then because I was a GM in Morocco and I had the choice, the opportunity to choose a partner to support through our foundation, um, I could actually make the choice to choose education for all to help them and make their impact bigger so we can actually get more girls in Morocco educated. And then obviously we know education is the start of empowerment. It then leads to, to work and, and financial independence. And so that's again, the, the kind of responsibility I felt I had. Um, I am a very lucky Moroccan woman because my parents have invested in my education, my sisters as well. We've been overseas. We've had, you know, had the chance to just um, be educated the best in the best universities and, and schools possible. And uh, I know it's not the case of the majority in my own country and expanding this to the entire region that I now look after. Um, it's, it's something that I'm, I feel very passionate about because I feel I can make a difference and use it for, for good. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. And I, I think um, I loved hearing, you know, kind of your journey that this wasn't where you started. So you were looking for a position in finance, but as you witnessed what Intrepid was doing and could do, I love that you embraced the possibilities that were given to you to kind of step into that role and and really start to create some significant change aligned with your values and your passions. And I think that um, I think that's really exciting about tourism. I've talked a lot about how much travel in, in you know intersects with social change and social justice. And because we are in all of these places, touching all of these places, there's really a lot of opportunity for impact. And so I get really excited when I start to see that happening and people being able to step into those roles and be really conscious about the impact that they are creating. Um, I would really love to talk to you next a little bit more about International Women Tourism and Travel Forum. I know that this is the first of our conversations kicking off, getting excited and prepared for this event, and that this is, you know, really aligned with what you were just talking about. Their mission is something that you're really drawn to supporting. And I would love to talk to you about why you think it's so important to create a space for discussions on gender, gender equity, diversity, and inclusion, and how this is happening at this forum. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, to tell you the story, back in 2018, I was on my one year one year and a half in my GM role, um, I was contacted by Alessandra, who is the founder and CEO of Women in Travel, to join a panel in a WTM, the World Travel Market in, in London. Um, that, that was about gender, um, you know, it was it was focused on gender, but gender equality. And she's um she's invited me. I've never been at that time I was I haven't been to WTM yet. So it was it was something completely new for me. And I think I've never been on a panel anyway. So never been doing any public speaking. So I, I've accepted gladly and I joined and I found myself sharing a panel with June Sarpong, the BBC presenter. I think she's BBC or TV presenter. 
and then the first lady of Iceland. So that was <laughs> quite, a, quite a challenge. But what we found in that conversation that was really well attended and, and a great conversation is that it was a start, something started. It was the first time ever that in a very large international space in the travel industry, the question of women in travel was raised and was discussed. And we ended up the panel and I'm a very, I'm very action focused type of person. And I think Alessandra is the same thinking and talking publicly about, okay, so what's next? And we literally talked about the need of a forum. That's a regular forum where we can talk about challenges that women face, the best practices, you know, learn about some of the examples of, you know, great practices or best practices that individual businesses are doing and, and just create that, create that space that didn't exist. And that's how the International Women in Travel Forum idea came. And that was in November, 2018, in January, 2020. So a year and a couple of months later, we actually hold the first one in Iceland and the first lady of Iceland hosted it. So as part of that conversation. So that was, that was incredible in my opinion to see the actions, you know, like just following the, the talks and that doesn't happen always like this. And that first forum was exactly about what I was saying about, it was about sharing, learning. I remember discussions or panels that happened where we had very high level um, women in, in like women in very high level positions talk about the challenges of, you know, the triple loads when you start to have kids and you've got to juggle with juggle with you know kids and work and and being a wife or a partner or whatever like just this kind of very honest and um kind of raw discussions that we we didn't really have a space to talk about to share about and just being able to talk about them was already uh, great because you could see um you know that you're not the only one um and so that was the, the first step and then since then we held two more um one virtually during the pandemic and another one in london last year and each time it become to me, the best travel industry event in the year. And it was so well attended that we had a, like a waiting list. I think more than hundred people were in the waiting list for last year, so we didn't have enough space. So Google who are hosting the, the event since then have decided to double the capacity. So we've got now the, the biggest, I think one of the biggest venue in, in London uh, to host it. And again, the topic and the, the conversations are all about the same thing. It's just really learning, sharing, improving, um, so we all get better and the industry is, gets better. And if I want to finish on one thing is we, we are in an industry that is ahead of the larger or, or the wider economy. When you look at the statistic, and this is from the UNWTO reports that went in 2018 about women in travel and in tourism, 54% of the workforce are women in travel versus 39% in the wider industry. 25% of Ministry of Tourism are women versus 20% in wider industry. Um, you know, the, I've got more of, the, of those stats. Oh, the gender pay gap is actually still not good enough, but it's still uh, less uh, big in the travel industry than it is in wider industry. So what we feel, and also I think it's more than 70% that the travel purchases are done by women. We state in our old company, our, the majority of our travel are actually women. So all of these statistics show that there is a, a potential and opportunity for the travel industry to be a massive driver of uh, gender equality or the reducing gender inequalities um, it employs one in 10 people in the world. So, you know, just the, these, these are kind of clear stats that show if we invest in travel, we can make change in the world for everyone. And, um, and yeah, that's, that's really what fa fascinated me about meeting Alessandra, learning about her work and, and that conference really highlights a lot of this information and gives tips to, to business leaders to make their business, you know, um, better and more diverse. Um, not just about women, but in general. Yeah. Uh, thank you for running through some of those statistics. That's definitely a space I've been spending a lot of time in the, this year. I've really been focusing personally on research in how sustainable travel can really support gender equity globally. And I think once you start looking at all the areas that tourism really does touch you know, women and how you can create opportunity for women, you can see pretty quickly how yeah. there is so much opportunity to create a change. And, um, you know, I get pretty fired up and excited as well. And so I'm really excited to attend this event for the first time this year in London and just be in the space that Alessandra has created with all of these other incredible women to be able to have these conversations. I think there just has seen such a shift in the last few years, even how women are coming together in the industry. And I'm a part of several different women's leadership organizations in tourism. And 
the the place that conversations were when we started those two or three years ago to now there's just such an evolution of how we can support one another and much like you were saying sometimes it's talking about really what it's like to be a woman working and what are these different responsibilities what what barriers does that create what opportunities does that create how can we support leadership for women if we do have these challenges and I think we're talking about it in a way that feels open and safe instead of trying to hide the fact that you're juggling all those things you're actually saying hey I'm juggling all these things how do we make that work and I just think even those like seemingly subtle shifts I, I think are going to be really important into to taking things to the next level pardon me to the next level um, and I, I did want to speak to you a little bit about that specifically. You know, I speak with so many of my guests about their interse intersecting identities, that how they shape the work they're doing. And, um, you know, for you, you know, you look at your roles as um, Moroccan woman, senior leader, diverse woman, young leader, a few of these things that you've already mentioned. How do you think that's influenced where you are now and where you want to go in the future and, you know, kind of the decisions that you'll be making? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, you start from, um, to me, from a lower level when you are all of these things, you know, because you, you start with, um, you know, you've got much more to prove to get where you, you want to be or where you, you think you want to be. Um, and so obviously it makes it makes you work harder in a way to to achieve your goals. And, and, and it shouldn't be like this. Clearly, it shouldn't be like this. I think we should, you know, businesses and the society should be supporting more, should be accepting that men and women are different, that, you know, the, the like, you know, people from different diverse back background are different. So there is a, how we call that, like a, um, is it a, um, like a, like a white, white person privilege that really exists and it makes, you know, uh, people not in the same level when they start. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so I feel like, it, it, should, it shouldn't be the case that we have to work twice harder to get where we are, because I believe um, I work for the right company that doesn't um, make any discrimination. So I have been given a lot of chances that are the same than anyone else. Um, before I got there, I really had to work harder. I had to struggle through my studies, through my first jobs. Um, you know, I've been sometimes, um, you know, hearing discriminatory things that, you know, didn't make me feel like, I was welcomed or I was in the right place. Um, and that's not normal. And I think that's, that's to me, you know, businesses really need to understand how important it is to put everyone in the same level. Because we, and I think we women in general, without going into the details of young or, or from a different background or whatever, we already underestimate ourselves. You know, I always say that often, you know, a man would go for a job if they feel they have 70%. We, I would go for a job if I feel I have 110%. <laughs> and, and it's been reflected in my career because when I went for, um, I didn't go for my, the general manager role I was mentioning with Intrepid. I actually didn't go for it. I had, my boss at the time was a woman who told me, for, for like, asked me for a little while. And I was like, I'm not interested. I'm very comfortable in my finance role. But she said to me, look, it's okay. Just take it as an acting role for six months until we find someone. Just because there's no one as senior as you, you can run the office, you know the people. And said, okay, if that's, that's what you need, I'll do that. So I didn't even want to go for it. Because again, I, I saw that I didn't have that 110% that I needed to be a GM. It was a big jump for me. And it's the same with my managing director role that I'm in now. Our company CEO called me in, uh, on, no, I think it was October 2019, to offer me the role that was available at that time, you know, without interview, without anything. So it shows how much trust they had in me and, and in my achievements. And I actually said, okay, I need a couple of days to think about it. And I get back to him, I said, sorry, I don't want to take it because I just, I'm not feeling ready for it. And then it took me three months to get convinced that I actually was ready for it and I should take it. And the fact is that since I took it, I'm delivering quite well in my role. And, you know, um, it's been a good move for me and for the business. And so, I no, I'm not the only one. And I work with women around. I've got four, one, two, three, three women general, general manager in my team. I had senior women throughout my career. And I'm trying to get them to, to feel confident about their capabilities and their, 
because they're brilliant and they just often because as women we feel like we are we're one level below and we've got to prove ourselves so I don't know if that makes sense what I'm trying to say yeah um, absolutely and it really resonates with a, a moment early in my career where I was applying for a job and I had a, a male colleague who I was friends with and I said I wanted to apply for this job but if I was looking at the qualifications I really felt like I didn't you know, fit all of them. And I felt like maybe I, it wasn't the right role. And, you know, he was trying to convince me, he's like, absolutely. You could, you already are doing most of these things anyway. And then looked at my resume and he's like, well, what are, this resume is horrible. You should be saying, you know, and he would take everything that I said were my qualifications and kind of like expand them and exaggerate them. He's like, this is how I would write my resume with your qualifications. And that was kind of my first awareness of how, of just what you're saying of how women kind of perceive, you know, what their qualifications are and really wanting to be overqualified and maybe apply for the job that's one step below where they're at or what they think they're comfortable with. Whereas, you know, often men that I've talked to are like, just apply for the job. All they can say is, that you're not qualified or there's just such a different way of thinking about it. And I do think that comes from this idea that we already feel like we have to prove something. And if we try to do something and then maybe don't do it well, because we weren't prepared, we're kind of letting every woman down. Like it, it feels a little bit like a pressure that's more for the collaborative and maybe not just for ourselves. I don't know if you feel that a little bit as well. Yeah, well, I think we put too much pressure on us and I've changed since and I've decided that not that I, you know, I think that kind of imposter syndrome is always there, but still, I I feel like I have a responsibility to shout about what I'm doing, shout about what the successes I'm achieving, because other women will see it and other women would think that they can do it as well, because otherwise it doesn't help everyone else. And I think there's a lot of very amazing women that are too shy to talk and um, just, you know, um, you know, humble, and it's a, it's a good thing to be humble, and you know that obviously is something I want to be. But sometimes you have to be a little bit more. Um, you know, um, you need to, to shout a little bit more about what you're doing because we know that women, ha- in general, they have this issue about projecting themselves and um, you know wanting perfection before m- you know moving up, and um, that lack of confidence, um, yeah, is is not helping them. And I think it's contributing badly to the gender pay gap that we have. It's, yeah, you know, women not negotiating their first salary, which is one of the reasons of the gender pay gap. Um, you know, it's you know we should be a bit more bold about it and and show examples and yeah, talk about this at least more. Yeah, yeah, I agree, and that, I mean that's also one reason why I really wanted to create this podcast is I wanted to give women a space to kind of to to talk about what they're doing and the work that we're doing and to just you know, raise the overall awareness of the incredible work that women are doing around the world and maybe not being recognized for um, as as a way to contribute to closing that gap a little bit. Um, And one of the things that I really wanted to talk to you about is also kind of in this vein is, you know, working to create a positive impact and opportunity for women. We definitely know that it's there. We've both talked about the statistics of how many women are engaged in the workforce but still creating higher level opportunities or more opportunities across the board. And I know you've been involved with um, some initiatives in Morocco to help increase the number of female tour guides and recently just had some great shifts um, in that area. So I'd love for you to talk about the work that you're doing there. Sure. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a story I'm very passionate about. And it started again, um, Intrepid as a business has different goals as any business, you know, we chase profit and we chase revenue and we chase different, you know, metrics as any business that is a for-profit business. Um, and as a GM, you've got to deliver on those goals. So when I just started as a GM, one of my goal um, was a purpose goal. So we always have a purpose goal. So it's either like a fundraiser goal around the Intrepid Foundation, or it could be a B Corp related goal, like to improve our score for the, the following certification. And that year specifically, the goal was about gender equality across or among our leadership team, not leadership, like tour leader uh, teams across the world. So when we looked at the numbers um, from a more like a office work perspective, we, we, were, we were quite good in um, reflecting, uh, in re- reflecting our customer database, I want to say. So I think around 55 something percent of our workforce was made of women. And um, problem was really when we looked at the tour guiding area, which is almost half of our workforce. So 
looking at, I think it was around 1,000 uh, tour leaders that we work with across the world, uh, we had less than 25% um, that were female. And then we start to dig into it to find that countries like uh, Jordan, Morocco, Egypt, India, Cambodia had very little. Actually, Morocco, we had zero. So my entire team of tour leaders were made of men. So I never realized or thought that that was a problem before we've been told, you've got a goal now to address it. And the goal specifically was to double that number by um, 2019. So... I started to dig into this issue and I realized a few things. One is that obviously culturally, this job is not necessarily seen in these countries as acceptable for women. So that's that's a given, no problem, I understand. However, when you look at the workforce in Morocco, women make 25% of the workforce. So at least there should be 25% of guys in Morocco that are women, at least. If not more, because we said the industry, the travel industry attracts more women. So then when you start to look into... Um, in, in the into more details, we found out that there are two categories of guides in Morocco, the mountain guides and the city guides. And the mountain guides, which are the ones that we mostly rely on to lead our trips, because a lot of our trips include adventurous uh, treks or, or you know, um, rural areas, you know, kind of walking um, activities. And most of our guides are mountain guides. Well, 10 of them only in the entire country were women. So in the entire country. So really we had an issue. So if we didn't have women, it was because actually there were very little amount, very little amount. And if we wanted to change that, obviously there was that cultural shift that needed to happen, but I found it was happening because our office was full of women. We had women, women in leadership position. I know my country, I know that women want to work. We have a very young population and there's unemployment. So these kind of jobs are really well paid. Three, four times more than minimum salary. They are really well paid. They are open to the to do the word that gets you to interact with internet people from overseas and different countries. I have a lot of leaders who ended up, you know, traveling overseas because of, of being in this job. Some of them even married uh, foreigners living in different countries. So it's, it's an amazing job, actually. It's a job that really opens your, your mind to different cultures. So then I realized that the problem was around the visibility, the awareness and the access to the job. So the job wasn't visible. People were not aware what it was about, that it was well paid, that it was a great job and all of that. And then to access it, it was completely opaque. We didn't know how to access it. And then you realize that it was the regulation behind that wasn't quite right. And the fact that Mr. of Tourism was not issuing uh, licenses in a regular basis. And then I compared with countries like Egypt, which to me are, are a bit culturally behind Morocco. And this country had plenty of female guides because you just need to go to university, choose it as a specialty, and then you get your license, and then you become a guide. And we had around 20 in our own team. So something wasn't quite right. And so that's why the work around getting the, the licenses issued to the, the, in the country was just pushing, talking to Ministry of Tourism, using uh, lobbying from the Australian ambassador at that time, who was a close friend of women who helped sending letters to the Ministry of Tourism from conversations around award applications that we did for to the Ministry of Tourism and using this as a, as a way to actually say, hey, do you, do you, are you going to issue more licenses? We need more licenses. Just create that one is that the private sector needed it. We then managed to get them to do a first test in 2018. And that first test has led to first us uh, sponsoring and helping some girls from our own office, our own surrounding to actually get the license so they can work for us, but also other girls and women hearing about us and our initiative and then coming naturally to us because they were like, wow, this company wants to hire people like us. So maybe they're a good company. And that's how we started to have female guides. Today, we have around 12 in a team of 120. So it's still not a lot, right? And so what we found out a couple of weeks ago is that a new test is going to be organized. We never stopped the kind of negotiation process. We've used any opportunity to, to make that happen. And we're really pleased that it has happened. So the test is happening in May and we are doing a campaign at the moment to get as many, many, many women possible. And we will help them with training, with logistical support, um, uh, so they can actually get access to this job and then we will offer them jobs uh, once that's that's happened and the goal is 50 percent now <laughs> it's not 12 out of 120. yeah well congratulations i mean that's so exciting to see you know changes being made because of you know really analyzing the problem and understanding where where you needed to to put things into place to create the shift and i i'm um really really excited to hear this news and hope that that also creates you know 
opportunities for other countries to look at the same things and start to investigate, you know, how they can support women in these roles. Because as you mentioned, you know, they are obviously typically held by men, but they are such high paying um, yeah. and really interesting opportunities. And I think it's really great to be able to get women into those roles, especially with the ways that I feel like women um, tell the stories of their destination and engage people and connect people to their destination. I think it's such a, a really important role for women to be able to have. Um, so I'll look forward to to hearing more and maybe we'll be able to follow up in a year and talk about the changes that have happened um, as, a, as a result of this. Um, to end our conversation, uh, I just have two more uh, questions for you that are kind of um, in our typical soul of travel. There are rapid fire questions, but I'm just going to lean into two of those with you. Um, the first is, uh, what are you reading right now? I feel like oh. this is one thing that right here. we get really inspired about and can, can expand what we're <laughs> learning and studying. So, Actually, it's not the most inspiring book ever. <laughs> I, I've got a... Um, um, a better one but this is i'm actually literally i'm reading this uh, you can't see it but it's I written it. <laughs> but it says playing to win how strategy really works and it's by ag lefley who is um former chairman and ceo of procter and gamble and it's all about strategies product strategies market strategies things that help shape um, business strategies to to win in whatever market or product they have so it's uh it's not like related to today's topic but it's very important for us uh, to keep raising as senior leaders when you run businesses and you know you're here to 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 deliver um, you know successful uh, you know metrics and important to learn from what other businesses are doing so that's that's what I'm reading it's a recommendation from Intrepid CEO James Thornton yeah thank you yeah I think it's it's so important and there's there's so there's so many more resources than there ever has been available to us right now so I think I always, I always love seeing what people are reading in the moment. Um, the, the last question I have for you, Soul of Travel, is really a space for telling the stories of women, recognizing uh, the work of women. So I'd love to ask if there's one person who you um, are inspired by or would like to recognize and honor the work that they're doing in this space. Well, there's many of them. <laughs> yes, I know. There's it's many. I, I, I actually say that our general manager in Morocco, Hala, um, she, when I when I was moving to the UK and I had that promotion, I had to backfill myself with a, with a local GM dedicated to our Morocco office that has become very big by then. And um, I had in mind that I wanted a Moroccan local women. It's just, it was just in my head. It was my objective. And I knew it would be very difficult. But funnily, she got inspired by uh, my own story, by write, reading about it in the you know, news or social media. And we were her clients. So she used to run a bank uh, that we used to, to work with. Um, and so um, it's funny because the bank lost us as a business and they lost their GM as well because she joined us. And so since then, she's, she's been very tough for her because the pandemic hit very quickly after, but she's been um, keeping things together really well and um, never forgot about the reason why she joined. And now that, you know, this, um, you know, this um, like a test is happening with the guiding, um, you know, the guiding test is happening. She's been leading the effort to just get the team on board. That she's communicating everywhere. She's organizing the trainings. She's talking to media. She's been this week, you know, in three national radios to talk about the reason why we needed this job to 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 be given to women. And uh, yeah, so she's doing an incredible job. And it was very challenging in a very challenging period of time to you know to start in the travel industry from a banking background but I think we, we've made the right, the right hire so I, I'll mention her for this one. Thank you I appreciate that and I also really appreciate you spending this time with us uh, today here in the podcast and I cannot wait to have the opportunity to meet you um, in person soon in London and hopefully also um, as I'm traveling through Morocco later this fall and let uh, me know. Yes, yes absolutely. absolutely send me details <laughs> yeah thank you so much for joining up. me <laughs> thank you thank you for having me it was lovely mm -hmm.